Hello students, welcome to the EPG Parkshala. I am Mrs. Bojwani from DI Deem University, the Alva Gagra. Today we are going to discuss about the module on in vitro production of triploids in the paper on plant biotechnology and crop improvement. In this lecture, we shall discuss the importance of triploid plants in crop improvement and describe the methods to produce triploids in vivo and in vitro. In some crop plants, triploids with three sets of chromosomes are superior to their diploid counterparts. Of course, the triploids are sterile, therefore doesn't produce seeds. So they are important only in those plants where the part of economic importance is other than the seeds, like the fruits or the vegetative parts. Therefore, triploids of some crop plants, such as banana and watermelon, which are seedless, but the economic product is the fruit, is already in commercial use. In nature, triploids occur very rarely. And the artificial method to produce triploids in nature, in vivo, is to cross tetraploids with diploids. Now, to produce tetraploids itself is a problem because many tetraploids are sterile. And then the problem may arise when you want to cross the tetraploids with diploids to produce triploids. Therefore, the totipont in nature of the endosperm cells has opened up a novel method to produce triploids in one step. In vitro, plants can regenerate from endosperm cells either directly or through the callus phase. When you culture immature endosperm, it's generally through a callus phase. First the callus is formed, and then the plants differentiate from the callus. However, in the case of uh, mature endosperm culture, the plants may also arise directly from the surface of the endosperm tissue. So the pathway of plant regeneration from the endosperm tissue is either through callusing or through direct differentiation, depending on the plant species, and the stage at which the endosperm is cultured. Let's first understand what are triploids. The triploids are plants with three sets of chromosomes. They are very important in uh, genetics and plant breeding. Some of the triploid plants or crops are superior to their diploid counterparts. For example, we have apple, banana, hop, mulberry, sugar beet, tea, watermelon, etc., which are already in commercial use. The conventional method to produce triploids is that you first take a diploid plant, you duplicate the chromosome number by treating with colchicine, and get tetraploids. And then the tetraploid is crossed with the diploids. And when the diploids and the tetraploids are crossed, because the gametes of tetraploids are 2N, and the gametes of diploids are haploid. So when they are crossed, they produce a 3N plant. It's a triploid plant. That's the conventional method. But it has certain problems. Very often the tetraploids are sterile. Secondly, the crosses of tetraploids and diploids may often fail. The in vitro method to produce triploid is welcome. In plants, most of the plant body cells are diploid. And when they produce gametes through meiosis, the gametes are haploid. But a unique phenomenon in the angiosperms called double fertilization fertilizes two cells in the female gametophyte. One is the egg, which forms the diploid embryo. The second cell, which has two haploid nuclei already, they fuse and one male nuclei fuse and produce the triploid nucleus, 
and that develops into a triplar tissue called endosperm. Here you see in the picture the embryo sac with eight nuclei and one sperm fusing with the egg cell to form the zygote, and the second one fusing with the two nuclei of the central cell forming the primary endosperm cell. The characteristic feature of endosperm is that it is short-lived, it is always unorganized, it is triploid, and it stores reserve food material and provides nutrition during embryo development and seed germination. You'll see here is a plant seed, a diploid seed. In the left, you have the endosperm tissue, but on the right, there's no endosperm tissue. Therefore, in some plants, the mature seed has the endosperm. We call them endospermous seeds. In others, it does not have because it is consumed fully during seed development. So it is ex albuminous or non endospermous seed. Now, as early as 1933, Lampe and Mills made an effort to culture the endosperm. But it was to the credit of LaRue in 1949 to establish a continuously growing tissue culture of maize endosperm. In maize, the endosperm is massive and mature seed has the endosperm, but the mature endosperm is dead. Therefore, it has to be cultured at an early stage when it is physiologically alive. So normally it is cultured eight to 10 days after pollination. So we culture immature endosperms. And after that, a number of people try to do and have established tissue culture of endosperm from immature endosperm. But it was only in 1963 that Mohan Ram and Sat succeeded in getting some proliferation of the mature endosperm of castrobene. They treated it with 2,4-D and it started to callus, a limited callus because it was in outside the cultures. But in 1964, Ranga, and Rao established tissue cultures of sandalwood. And they, after that, you have a number of examples like Croton, Jetropha, Putranjiva, where tissue cultures of mature endosperm have been established. An important factor which is necessary for the proliferation of mature endosperm is the embryo factor, which means that initially, when you get want to get a tissue culture of mature endosperm, you have to culture the entire seed, decoated seed, which means it contains the embryo. And after some time, when the endosperm has started to proliferate, this embryo can be removed, which suggests that embryo provides certain factors which is necessary to induce divisions in the mature cells of the endosperm. And it was later shown that this embryo factor can be substituted by gibberellic acid. You see this figure shows the curve where they found out this effect of soaking the seed in water before culturing it for different days. And you will see that the percentage of end culture showing proliferation of endosperm increase with the days of soaking the seeds in water. And here are the pictures to show you that in the case of croton, when the whole decoated seed was cultured, the embryo started to germinate, but also the endosperm opened and from inside it started to callus. It is at this stage that the embryo must be removed, otherwise embryo will also start to callus, and the two types of calli, the endosperm callus and embryo callus, may mix up. And you know that the embryo callus is diploid and the endosperm callus is triploid. And once you remove it, the endosperm continues to proliferate and you can get a tissue culture established. Immature endosperm is still an explant of choice because of two reasons. 
the mature endosperm in cereals is dead, is physiologically dead. The massive endosperm in the cereals, but physiologically is dead, therefore it doesn't even divide. In other plants where the endosperm is absent in the mature stage because it is consumed during seed development is another situation where one can culture endosperm only at the immature stage. For example, mulberry, citrus, acacia have endosperm, but at the maturity, the endosperm is not present because it's consumed. And these are called ex-albuminous seeds. So wherever the endosperm is not there in the mature seed, or the endosperm is not alive, the choice is to culture the immature endosperm. The important factor to establish tissue cultures of endosperm is the culture medium, as in most other tissue culture systems. When Lamp and Mills 1933 started endosperm culture, he used potato and young corn green extract. But LaRue in 1949, when he established the tissue culture, he used a variety of natural extracts like tomato juice, green corn juice, yeast extract, cow's milk, of which tomato juice was the best. But tomato juice is not a defined supplement. You don't know what it contains. So eventually in 1960s, when Strauss worked on the endosperm culture of maize, he demonstrated that yeast extract was as good as tomato juice. So one could substitute. But yeast extract also is not a pure substance. It contains a number of compounds beside the vitamin B complex. So in 1960, he, Strauss again demonstrated that instead of using yeast, one can make a defined medium by adding asparagine alone, which could substitute for yeast extract. In Nakajima in 1963, with a detailed experiment on the nutrient requirement established that a medium containing oxen, a cytokinin, and an organically rich compound like yeast extract and casein hydrolysate is necessary. And this is the medium that is widely used. Now, for a very long time, it was a kind of a myth, both with the embryologist and the tissue cultures, they felt that the endosperm tissue, which is not a normal tissue, because it has an additional set of chromosomes, is not capable of organizing into plants. Because in nature, there is no example whatsoever that the endosperm forms an organ, even root, or not even cellular differentiation like tracheidal differentiation. So for a very long time, people felt that endosperm lacks the totipotency because of the presence of the third set of chromosomes. But in 1965, for the first time, in the case of Exocarpus cupressiformis, seed cultures, decoded seed cultures, Jory and Bojwani observed the differentiation of shoot buds from the surface of the endosperm. And you can see in this picture, the embryo has germinated. You can see the root and the hypocotyl. And the surface of the endosperm is differentiating well-organized shoots, which could be excised and could be cultured. After that, regeneration of plants or shoots or embryos has been reported in 23 species including many important crop plants such as apple, citrus, kiwi fruit, mulberry, papaya, rice and sandalwood. Now regeneration from the endosperm in the case of in the family Centellaceae and Laurentaceae occurs directly from the endosperm. But in the case of sandalwood, neem and citrus, the endosperm first forms a callus and then differentiates plants. 
So you have two pathways of regeneration of plants from endosperm. One is a direct regeneration, other is after callusing. And even from callus, when you put on another suitable medium, regeneration is either by organogenesis or by embryogenesis. Embryogenesis has been reported in sandalwood, citrus, and walnut. And organogenic differentiation from the callus of endosperm occurs in neem, rice, and mulberry. Here is a pictures of the endosperm culture of neem. And you will see that in A, the endosperm was cultured with the embryo. The embryo has become green. The endosperm has burst open to expose the green embryo. And at this stage, this embryo is removed. And the endosperm is continued on the same medium. It continues to grow and differentiate shoots. You see in the C, the callus of endosperm of neem is differentiating shoots. For the regeneration of plants from the endosperm tissue, a cytokinin is always essential. Some plants, in addition to cytokinin, require an auxin. And where the regeneration occurs via callusing, it may be a two-step process because you may require one medium for callusing on which it may not differentiate and require transfer to another medium for the differentiation of organs. For example, in the case of mulberry, the endosperm starts callusing on a medium on BAP and NA, but for the continuous growth of the callus, it is subcultured on a medium with only 2,4-D. And it is maintained on this medium as long as it likes, but when it is to be induced to differentiate shoots, it is again transferred back to a collagenesis medium which contains BAP as a cytokinin and NAA as the auxin. Most of the plants regenerated from endosperm tissue are triploid. This is interesting. Thus, it offers a direct method for triploid production. As I said, that the conventional method is a very cumbersome and lengthy, where you have to produce tetraploid. The tetraploid must be crossed with diploids, and then the diploids and tetraploids are to be crossed and produce triploid. And there are more problems at every step. But here is a method where you can regenerate triploid farm directly from the endosperm cells. And you will see here some steps in the production of triploid plants from endosperm of mulberry. You see at the top of this, you see a section of the seed at the time of culture. There is a immature embryo surrounded by endosperm tissue. And here is a explant prepared from that seed. And this is, of course, a stained picture where you can show, see the embryo and the endosperm tissues lying around it. This is when the endosperm with the embryo is cultured. The brown part of the endosperm and the green part, which is the emerging from inside the endosperm, is the embryo. And at this stage, the embryo is excised and removed. And the brown tissue, which is brown but still alive and growing, is transferred to a fresh medium for multiplication. As I said earlier, it is transferred to 2,4-D medium for maintenance of culture. And here is a well-growing callous tissue from the endosperm, which can be multiplied as long as you like by subculturing it, or by transferring this callus to BAP in an auxin medium, you can induce the differentiation of shoots. So the multiple shoots are arising from the endosperm callus, and these shoots can be rooted, and the plants can be transferred to soil. So plants have been, the triploid plants have been established in soil from endosperm, 
And you can see the chromosome number of 42, which is a triploid number of chromosome. And here is a detailed protocol that one follows for the regeneration of plants from the endosperm of mulberry. Here's a protocol which you saw in the pictures. Now, what are the applications of these triploids? Because a triploid plant will be seed sterile because it cannot have a normal meiosis, so it cannot form viable gametes. And the viable gametes are not formed, seeds are not formed. However, there are plants where seed is not the commodity of commercial purpose. It's the other parts of the plant that are used. And if triploids are better than the diploids, in those characteristics, other than the seed, it becomes a valuable commodity. I mentioned to you earlier that triploid plants already in commercial use for non-seed traits are for just like petunia. The plants, the flowers of petunia in triploids are more vigorous and ornamental than diploids. In tomato, the triploid fruits are larger and tastier. And in cassava, the roots were high yield harvest index, dry matter is high, and starch content is high. In the case of coccinia, the larger and less stringent fruits are formed as compared to the diploids. And of course, the watermelon banana, you see there are no seeds. Normal watermelon has got a lot of seeds, which is a very messy thing to eat. But you can produce triploids, and the triploids are no seed. It's very convenient and enjoyable to eat it. In conclusion, we can say that the endosperm tissue is unique to angiosperms, and it is unique in several ways, such as it is triploid, it is short-lived, and it is undifferentiated. In nature, it never differentiates even the trachidal elements. Therefore, the botanists always felt that this tissue lacks the capacity to differentiate plants like the other plant tissues. However, this myth was removed when in 1964, Johari and Bhojwani reported the differentiation of shoots from the mature endosperm of Exocarpus species. And this report was followed by several other publications reporting the regeneration of plants from endosperm tissue, including some important crop plants such as rice, sandalwood. So it is now well established that the triploid cells of the endosperm are totipotent and can regenerate triploid plants via organogenesis or embryogenesis. With several examples of triploids being agronomically superior to their diploid counterpart, endosperm culture opens up a new technique for direct production of triploids for commercial purpose. Triploids are seed sterile, and there could be that therefore it would be of interest only where the economic part of the plant is other than seed, such as the roots, leaves, flowers, or the fruits. Thank you.